challenging schedule, and this is where we get into um, the control for incorporation ownership rules, and they can be complex when we're looking at more than one corporation, partners in um, either domestic or foreign businesses, and estate planning, the use of um, irrevocable trust. So I have the instructions here for Schedule O, and you'll find these in the general instructions for the Form 5471. <clears throat> and I wanted to point out some things in the instructions, and then we'll get over to the form. The form, of course, starts off pretty nice. The name of the person filing the form, the name of the foreign corporation, I always get a tax EIN for my clients because they're filing a form 5471. This is to be completed by U.S. officers or directors. So this is kind of interesting. Um, if your client's not an officer or director, they're not going to be doing this. If they are an officer or director, they're going to, in effect, probably be printing in their own name. Part two below is to, to be completed by the shareholder. Um, so that's going to get a little bit complex, we're going to see. So part one over here on the instructions is where we want to enter the day for the shareholder first has 10% or more in value of the voting stock or, I'm sorry, in, in value of stock or the voting power. This is a, a key part in international taxation because a 10% because less than a 10% shareholder is not considered a U.S. person except for when it comes to closely held or captive insurance companies. The way the stock was acquired, quite often the stock is just being issued by the corporation. And the form itself, as we come down here to Section C, you'll see the name of the shareholder filing the schedule, the class of stock, common, preferred, quite often the British call the shares, ordinary shares, a data of acquisition, a method of acquisition. When it's directly issued by the corporation, you just place in those words. This is where the law becomes complex and confusing for most people. So we're going to get into that here some, and we're going to get into it more with the Form 5471. And it's the word is directly, indirectly, and constructively. This form, Form 5471, uh, attempts to explain it, but they don't explain it the way that you and I would like because they told you to read a code section. And we're going to kind of summarize these right now. Code section 958A is the code section that determines who is going to pay tax on the subpart F income of a controlled foreign corporation. And that requires a direct owner over here or an indirect owner. So you have to be one of those two. A constructive owner never pays tax. The constructive ownership rules are found in um, Section 958B. They're a lot like Section 318. And that is used to determine if family attribution or related business partner attribution would make the corporation a controlled foreign corporation. You can have a controlled foreign corporation and have nobody paying tax on the subpart F income because to pay tax on the subpart F income, you have to own voting stock. You have to own 10% or more of the voting stock. And this is how a lot of the big firms shift the income to where they want it to go or people like Mitt Romney that had his super large self-directed IRA avoids tax. His IRA can have the voting shares, he can do all the voting, he himself can have non-voting shares and pay no tax on the income. The other part before we close off the instructions I want you to, to take a focus on is, um, let me make this a little bit smaller, so on this, the next page here, of the instructions, and, and it's hard to read, but I'll read it to you. Um, it says, let's talk about Mr. Lyons. And if, um, it says, Mr. Lyons also required to submit a chart if the foreign corporation is a member of a chain of corporations 
and to indicate if he's a 10% or more shareholder in any of those corporations. So it's the chart, and this is what CPAs quite often miss. They do the form, they pull it up on LaCert or some other software, and the software is not giving you the highlight, giving you the warning that without the chart, you haven't filed a complete and accurate tax return. Is This is what the IRS really want. So we're going to close off this form, and we're going to um, get over here to my windows, if I can't. Um, somehow get rid of this guy here without getting rid of everything good. I did a good job. Okay. So um, let's make this bigger. Ah, I did a good job getting the long size big. So let's get over to the form I want here. Okay. This is the form I want. So let's go through this just a briefly because the instructions are really the main action part. The name of the person filing, the shareholder, we did all that. Acquisition, we talked about that. Um, this form goes, see, this goes on to the next page. Amount paid or value given. So in case you're not putting in cash, you're putting in property, intangible, back to the website. This is going to, going to kick in. The name address of person from whom the shares were acquired. When you're getting shares of, from the corporation, originally you just need it, issued by the corporation. Disposition of stock. A lot of people don't do not know that this form is required when you dispose of stock of a foreign corporation. That's usually a taxable event, maybe a taxable loss, a taxable event. The IRS wants to know exactly what's going on. Sometimes it's a gift for um, estate tax planning. Sometimes it's a sale. Sometimes it's redemption. Shares disposed of directly means shares issued in your name. Indirectly means shares through a nominee. Um, somebody's holding the shares on behalf of your client. And a lot of non-Americans think if their brother holds the shares for them or somebody in the family, they are not the shareholder. Not the case. Constructively, you can only imagine how complex this is um, when you have a big family. So when you dispose of the share, they want to know what your constructive reduction is in ownership. And that's a, a nightmare. The, one of the main points of this is to show this form to your client so the client understands this is going to be an expensive form. This is just Schedule O. This is not the Form 5471. This is a form that you only do maybe once or twice, once when the client goes into the business, once when he goes out of the business, the amount received, who bought the stock, the IRS wants to be able to face that. We organizations, we don't see that too often, but we see it often enough. You want to give all that information that's really important. You want to get the three years running on the statute of limitations, especially with a tax-free reorganization. It is very easy to do a tax-free reorganization from one controlled foreign corporation to another controlled foreign corporation. It's not easy to go a tax-free reorganization from a controlled foreign corporation to a non-controlled foreign corporation. So as a planning tool, sometimes a controlled foreign corporation is the better choice. Additional information. And the IRS just wants to kind of track stuff what's going on. The chart again. They really want this chart of what's going on. Some people have chains of... of um, corporations, they have joint ventures with people. This is where the IRS starts to put together the profile so when they do audit you, they're ready to go. And you don't want to leave the chart off because the problem is that may have been an incomplete tax return and then the client has the statute open, there's a penalty, we saw the new 40% tax penalty on top of the, the one for the return itself, which is $10,000. So it's important to do the chart even if it's time consuming, uh, even if it's not perfect because of the constructive ownership rules. I can surely understand that they're very vague. So that is this for this one.